Hey everyone, this week's episode is part two of our discussion on the pervert's guide to ideology. If I can wrap up the theme of our discussion in one little message, it would be ideology is messy. In this second half of the discussion, we talk about all the ways that ideology isn't really controlled by the ruling class or how when you see the exact same thing in a different way, it can kind of break you out of your your ideological stronghold. We're also going to talk about how the left can beat itself up, how capitalism will let you buy your own salvation, or it's also willing to sell you dissent, how everything is permitted, and how your dreams aren't your own. With that, here's the episode. Ideology is not always completely figured out. We can see times when people introduce a piece of ideology to accomplish a certain specific task, but it's not always the case that the ruling class is all in lockstep with one another and that they've got figured out, mm. oh, we do this and then we get this and then we do this and we get this. There, there are times when we see in capitalism the ruling class divided or a, a sort of backlash where... They, they have attempted to accomplish something via ideology, but they've created a monster now that they cannot control. Mm -hmm. One example of this that comes up in the movie is when Zizek is talking about the riots in London. He points out that what happened there was that people stole things. They, they acted out acts of consumerism. And everyone was trying to kind of figure out, okay, what that meant, how are we going to interpret these acts? How are we going to interpret these riots? And Zizek makes the point that you can't really say that it was a protest against capitalism. You know, that you might be tempted to say that as someone on the left. But what you can say is that these people are, live in a capitalist world, like we all do, that tells them to consume, that tells them if you want to be a good citizen, you've got to buy a big screen TV and you've got to have this and that and all the other things. But then the same system fails to give them the means to accomplish that. Mm. And when you have a system that says to be a good citizen, you must do X, but it does not give you the means to do X, then you are breeding a sort of instability amongst your people. You're subjecting them to, you know, the, this ideology that tells them they're not good and doesn't give them the means to amend that. Mm -hmm. And so it should be no surprise at all that riots led to the looting of stores because that's what capitalism set up. Not because that was what the capitalists wanted to have happen, but each individual capitalist wants everyone to buy their stuff so they advertise but each individual capitalist wants to maximize their own profits, so they pay their workers very lowly, mm. or as lowly as they can. And that leads to a gap between what has been presented as the good life and what has been presented to you as your ability to, ch to achieve it. Yeah. And, and that is evidence of something he, he mentions too, where you can be aware of the ideology that you live within. Um, and you can be aware that maybe it, it's a little bit of a facade, but operate within it nonetheless because it, it, like we kind of mentioned before, it's comfortable to do so and it makes sense. So these people, they, they do that, but there's a, there's a friction point where they're not able to maybe even sometimes articulate what, what it is that they are feeling there, the pressure they're feeling. Um, cause the, it's a unique pressure to not be able to buy things and to be poor anyway, but to also have in the back of your mind a feeling that you, you should be able to buy these things and, and it, there's something wrong with you that you can't adds a particular friction. And he called, he said that it was, um, that every violent act is the frustration of something you cannot put into words. And he was saying that, that people caught in this I ideology, the riots were, were ways that they could act out because they, in ways 
that they could not do otherwise because they couldn't put words to it. And I, and I don't know if that's necessarily going to be true of any violent act, but I think there is a kernel of truth in there, which is uh, there's something that, that is really striking about that because um, ideology is seeking to have these people not be able to understand the, the friction it's putting on them and doesn't want them to be like aware of that. But people are. And, and then acting out against that in a violent way is definitely still an, an expression. You know, like, uh, yeah, so I, I, I thought that that was, that that was, um, that was cool for him to bring up. Well, you were talking about how the, the ruling class might not have the same idea of things and ideology isn't, um, set in stone, you know, and that, that is one of the things that's most hopeful about this movie, um, is that it's not set in stone and that's one of the ways that you can subvert it. And, and talking about it is a big way to sort of unravel it sometimes at the scenes, put those glasses on you and they live. And that's why it thinks, makes me think of the Ramstein thing that you brought up before. Um, and I had trouble understanding what he meant by that too, but then it kind of clicked for me. Ramstein is, it's like, a, is death metal the right way to put it? It's a German, like, death metal band. Um, they appropriate a lot of Nazi imagery. And from the outs outside, you would sort of think that they were probably like neo-Nazis or something, um, if you didn't know anything about them, because they do use that. Um, but I think, like, what came to me to be apparent um, with Ramstein is that they, he said that um, they, they free the Nazi symbolism, not, those ties to the Nazi ideology. They, and what, how, what, how uh, Zizek put it is that they bring it to a pre-ideology place these symbols. The, so these things that we associate with the, the Nazi party, like the boots, the, the, the goose stepping, boot stepping, what is it? Goose steps? Goose stepping. Yeah, yeah. the goose steps. And I, and I keep thinking about the, the big leather boots, yeah. um, a, lot, a lot of different leather. And um, I think, did they actually, did they do, they do a gesture that was sort of Hail Hitler-ish as well. Um, but it's, it is devoid of the actual ideology. And to me, it, it, they have nothing to do with Nazi party, um, and they are not. Their songs are not about like preaching fascist ideals or anything like that. Uh, and what it sort of trivially trivializes it because when you think about those things as uh, lock and step with Nazism, it sort of um, legitimizes it. Like Nazism had a look, they had a symbol, and they had these things that were part of it. And the truth is, no, those things were just things. And if you have groups that do this. You strip Nazism of all those symbols, of all those things that made them seem intimidating, all those things that made them seem legitimate, and you kind of just spread them out, and Ramstein kind of does that, kind, kind, of, kind of trivializes them in a way. And I thought that that was a cool showing that you can demantle ideology yeah. with new ideology. Like with the, the High Hitler thing, just a quick thing about that for how that exists before. Everybody did that to flags. You can look up and it's very creepy to see now. Oh, like pictures of young American kids yeah. doing that yeah. to the American flag. I don't remember what it was called. It was a type of it was just how everybody said um, their like pledges of allegiance to their countries. and mm -hmm. just like, like to the flag. Salute. Yeah, it was a generic so that I don't remember what it was called. It makes sense. It's kind of like um, like the Romans would be like, yeah, and like raise their spears at people. It probably comes from that, you know, like, mm -hmm. but yeah, anyway, that was my quick side note. Yeah. Yeah. Like outside of the Nazi context, you can see why it's a very, it seems like a very noble gesture. Very like it's, it's a strong gesture. Like you can understand why it was used for sure. Um, but yeah, that's why it, it took me a little bit with Ramsan. In fact, my first couple notes with it was like, how, how does it trivialize it? I don't quite get it. Um, but then it, it sort of clicked for me when I started thinking about like, oh, the Nazis kind of don't get to have these symbols the way they used to if we just start using them in other ways. And you can do physical things that, um, that dismantle the ideological abstract concept. The only thing I would say is I think it's only a partial dismantling. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons why Rammstein uh, takes on these this imagery is because it's sort of forbidden. Right. Right? Like, that's kind of part of, uh, of death metal and I, I think other subcultures is it's kind of interesting and sexy to do... A little taboo. Yeah, yeah. Be, because of the taboo. Uh, of course, by doing something that's taboo... You make it less taboo. You're making it a little less taboo. Yeah, that's the dialectic of, of, yeah. of subculture. So they're sort of opening the door. They're sort of using it to still be a little sensationalist. Um, 
is sensationalistic, but they're sort of opening the door to making this very commonplace, to sort of letting them, getting them on the journey to really becoming that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like all the, uh, and how was it, 70s, 80s, the like satanic imagery and rock music that people were sure was going to destroy mm-hmm. the country and stuff. I mean, now it's common. I just walk around and say, hey, hail Satan. People are like, hail Satan. It is kind of funny when you hear people say hail Satan. <laughs> I, mean, I agree. That was dumb. I think it's, no, <laughs> I, I totally, I think it's it's funny as an um, ironic thing to say now because it's just like, who, no one's Satanist. Like, there are Satanists, but it's not like they'd ever actually be a danger to anything. It's just a funny thing that people were, people can get afraid of a lot of stuff. It's that fear. And yeah. Satanists, it's weird to think it's at a certain time in this country there was uh, a fear epidemic of satanic cults like stealing babies. Like we didn't realize that. Um, I had to. I think I listened to a crack podcast where they talked about that being one of the the national fears. You know, like razor blades and candy. There was this fear of uh, saint worshippers, and not only was it incredibly factually inaccurate, but it was so silly that by the time that I started to have a sense of what was going on nationally, it didn't exist. Which was probably the early nineties. Yeah. Like I never. Yeah, it just it just it evaporated because it was so ridiculous. But at the time, um, it sounds like it really kind of reached a fever pitch. Yeah. Now they're just worried about generally people stealing kids. Yes. Like when you have kids in the hospital, they do not recommend that you put out a birth announcement so that people don't like try and track down your kid and steal them. Wow. Like that is explicitly they're like. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It's a liability thing for them too, probably. Even if mm-hmm. it even if it very rarely happens, when it does happen, it probably looks really bad for that hospital. Right. So there could be a little bit of them cultivating fear to save their butts um, and making it seem worse than it is. But yeah, I mean, it does put an alarm happens. system physically on the baby? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Look, it's yeah, can't get the and the baby can't leave that that ward. Yeah, airplane graveyard that was cool. Um, Zizek goes to the the airplane graveyard in the southwest uh, United States. And it's just, I think it's in the United States, right? Yeah. And and, and maybe there's more than one. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but the, it was interesting to put there. And I think the point that he made that was interesting to me there is that we need to see this as the the logical conclusion of our consumerism. It's hidden from us. It's out of sight, out of mind, because it is a, a, a dirty p- clue of like what's happening around us. Um, and he, he sort of, he said, we need to see this waste, this inertia to show the logical conclusion of consumerism. And, and I think inertia is a good way to put it because inertia makes it feel like a momentum that we necessarily can't stop, that we're being pulled along with. And so I thought like inertia was just a really good word to use. But, um, and Je- Slavoj does that a lot. He has a really good way with words. Um, and it was probably makes him so so um, interesting to listen to. I mean, I'm I best that's part of why he does what he does. But yeah, that was cool for me. Yeah. By the way, I just looked up. There are quite a few, even notable airplane graveyards. Mm. There are a lot. Okay. Yeah, mostly in deserts. We humans make a lot of trash. Like landfills are. The sneaky way of trying to like pretend like we don't mm-hmm. because you you know they're out in the middle of nowhere you don't see them they try and hide everything yeah I also think that it is something that's it, like landfills are at least more part of the the cultural consciousness than than this you know and this is it, it's striking in a weird way because we do not associate these things with with waste we do not associate like the innovation of flight with that but it too it is it, uh, just a, a piece of this consumerist um, ideological puzzle, and it, fall, it, it, it like almost everything else, produces waste. I mean, a lot of it. Um, because, and, and that's part of what we need to see. And it, it, it's striking to see those, these just empty husks out there, because they're very big still. A lot of them aren't broken apart. And they, they just look abandoned. They look lost. And they, you know, we really associate them with like one of the main wonders of like human innovation. And here they're just sort of discarded, which, yeah, I mean, there's better things they could do with them, um, certainly. But yeah, it's it's a it's a cool visual. You guys remember him talking about taxi driver? Yeah, yeah. That was in it, the thing that he covered there that I thought was a cool point was that he was talking about fantasy at work in in ideological systems, where it 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 covers up inconsistency in our perspective, in our thoughts, in our ideology. That you can use fantasy 
and, and I think kind of the way he put it is that you can sort of project personal fantasy onto things, just ignore, for, say, for example, the gap you were talking about with, with the rioting. And because it's an easy answer, it, it's um, the path of less re- least resistance when you compare it to having to rethink your ideology. He also related the, the violence in Taxi Driver to when that fantasy can't cover things up anymore. Sometimes, if that's what you're using, your only reaction is to to sort of strike out, like, to, to lash out, rather. One of the things that stands out to me in the taxi driver analysis is that Zizek points out in that film, and he's done this for Fight Club, too, in the past, that one of the parts of liberation is to turn your analysis inward to attack mm. the part of yourself that is the oppressor. So because of ideology, certain parts of our own belief systems and, and who we are as, as a self is, is tied in with that, is, is kind of swallowed up and determined by that. I think that that is a good thing to do, but I also think that it can go too far mm. in the sense that there is a certain part of the left where you at some point give up on large social actions, probably because the left has not been in a winning position the last several decades. Uh, right now we seem to be doing good in the sense that, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders candidacy is doing way better than I think anyone could have imagined. You know, previously, during the 80s and 90s and 70s, things weren't going so great for the left. I think a lot of leftists turned inward entirely. So it became all about being vegan and all about how much you personally recycled and all about um, meditating and things like that. And, and those are all good things, but they don't replace the, the social transformation of society. And the fantasy mm. aspect along with ideology makes me think of, I want to say Mark Twain. We'll just say that because he's always misattributed for quotes. <laughs> um, Oh, well, it's probably not him, but the America is a nation of temporarily embarrassed millionaires <laughs> to explain why people vote and do things so against their own interests. Mm. You talked at one point about Starbucks. Oh yeah, um, giving giving one percent of of what they I think what of their profits or of all the money they take in to to charity. Um, yeah, one percent of their income. And he, was, and he was talking about how this is a, an easy way to, to assuage our, our guilt of being um, so rich and to being part of, of a society that, that is, it, it historically and presently exploits and um, not only its own citizens but other cultures around the world. Um, and that, yeah, it's, it's an easy way for consumerism to sell you peace, to sell, to sell you doing something right, but you're still just buying. You're just still just consuming and you... It, it, it in the long run, I think it's worse, um, and he would probably agree. I think because that is is a very it's a small thing, and it w- it stops you from thinking about um, fighting consumerism. You, you're giving up that will to fight consumerism for the price of a cup of coffee. And yeah, that that sort of complacency, the fact that it's something that can be sold, is I think one of capitalism's strongest assets in its sort of war to not be like um, overthrown is that it can sell you you thinking that you're doing something to change things. I think it relates to another point that he made in the movie where he's talking about religious ideology. I think there's a strong connection between the Starbucks type of charity where you perform charity through your normal consumption and the confession of of a churchgoer in Catholicism. It's this kind of, I bought my coffee, so I've done my good deed in capitalism and in Catholicism. Oh, I've gone to confession mm-hmm. and I've said my Hail Marys. So I've... I've Atoned and, yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. for the evil that's in the world. And, and I think they're both empty in this certain way, where you really actually haven't fixed the root problem. Mm-hmm. They're comforting gestures, but they're only for you. Yeah, yeah. What you're really doing is making yourself feel good about having done your duty mm. as a good citizen, yeah. but you you haven't done anything to change that system. He yeah. says something in that that I really like where he essentially says, I just want to be an egoist, meaning 
I don't want to have to worry about all of the poor people when I buy my coffee. You could take that as, as like a very harsh right wing kind of thing. But I think his, his point is, I don't want to have to worry about it because I don't want that to be the way coffee is produced. Mm -hmm. If we had a just society where the folks making the coffee were in control of their own means of production, if it was done, you know, as what we might call as a cooperative or in, in a socialist or communist mode of production, whatever word you want to use, if it was a mode of production that empowered the workers and did not have a ruling class above them, then there wouldn't necessarily be a need to have this whole charity mechanism and people could just go and buy a cup of coffee without also buying their salvation. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the salvation, just make a just society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing that Marx got or didn't see with capitalism in his, his many analyses is that he didn't realize that capitalism would be so good at incorporating things like that into its structure. Mm -hmm. And that's what's made it so resilient is it's wonderful at co-opting things. Mm -hmm. It's because it's very easy to just throw some money at a problem and pretend like you're doing something about it, even maybe do actually a little bit of something about it, but it just becomes all about the money and the spending yeah. towards it. And the first time I learned about that, basically capitalism's ability to package and sell you back dissent against capitalism was in college in a Marx and Freud class with a professor named Stacy Thompson. But he talked about that, and his specific example was Green Day at the time, um, because they, they packaged themselves as a punk rebellion, but they were highly corporatized uh, and they and merchandised like mad. They were, they were a business entity, um, and they could sell you that feeling. And you buying that feeling totally subverted you having that feeling because you were supporting the opposition. And, and yeah, that, that is, it, it is ingenious in its, in this sort of sinister uh, efficiency, like the way that it can sort of crumble you. Because it's not, you don't even realize it's happening, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it totally just sweeps the uh, carpet out from under you. Yeah, Like Hot Topic. Yeah. This is another good example. of. Um, he mentions that he compared capitalism to religion or Christianity in another way, too, that he said that capitalism has a religious structure and that it has to expand. It has to spread itself and find people, like indoctrinate people who are willing to, to sacrifice for it. Early on, he talks about, I thought he talked about religion a little bit. Oh, yeah, with Climb Every Mountain, he, he talked about the obscene contract. And that's sort of what we're talking about here, where he, he was saying that you, if you're covered by God and you can atone, you're basically justified to do anything you want. If you always feel like you can be forgiven because you're doing the right thing. You have the right guy in your corner. And then towards the end, he starts talking about God a lot more. And it's sort of the same thing. He's, um, but what I thought was interesting was the, the support of slants on atheism. Mm. And I wouldn't say that I am an atheist. But I would say that you need to think like an atheist in this world, I think, to be, to be practical. You need to, I think you need to feel and, and express yourself like a religious person. But I often think that you need to look at the world in the sense that there is no higher power that can tell you everything. You need to figure it out for yourself. And everyone around you needs to figure it out for themselves. Because what he said is, if there is no God, all is permitted, is a, an often way to attack atheism. If there is no God, you can do whatever you want. There's no reason not to. Which is, it's a freaky argument to make, because you think like, oh my gosh, are you only being good because you think there's a God? It's kind of scary when people use arguments. Like, that's, that's not why I'm being good. But he says, no, if there is a God that you believe in, that's when everything is permitted. Because you can justify anything. We, we've seen that in history. We see that now with, ra with um, radical terrorism. And we see that with the, the radical reaction in the, the right Christians in this country, even. Uh -huh. You can justify any sort of hate baiting. You can justify any violence if you think that there is a deity that's making you righteous, that's feeding you that. And the big thing, the big distinction he had that really struck to the core of why I am not a member of an organized religion, is that in religion, you must do your duty. And it's period. You have a duty and it's given to you, you must do it. In atheism, you must do your duty, but you must also decide what your duty is. That responsibility is on you. And because it's on you to decide what your responsibility or what your duty is, it's also on you to constantly reevaluate that, to think about why that's your duty, and to maybe change that be a little more flexible because you don't know everything and your life changes and and your ideas change it really it's less rigid and it's more open-minded and it's a way to look at the world that is more nuanced and complex 
and doesn't it's not brittle and doesn't break and you don't have to have those outbursts those violent angry responses to things it's so anyway i yeah that really struck a chord with me that uh that chord wasn't struck when you played the assassin's creed games the nothing is true everything is permitted yeah which is a that's what that quote on that other quote always makes me think of yeah but even that just saying nothing is true everything is permitted yeah, that's dangerous because you, you can use that to justify anything too. Yeah. But saying that it's your responsibility to make sure that you're being moral, that's not saying everything's permitted. That's saying that, but it's saying that we need to work it out together and it means that you're going to be less likely to be controlled by those things because you are constantly analyzing not only your values but the faculties and the experiences that led to those values. I think it's always interesting Zizek's way of getting to atheism as well is through Christianity where he says okay there was God the big man in the sky for a long time and then there was God the son when Jesus was on earth and then we killed him and now God is dead and it's just left up to humanity to figure it out from now on which is maybe I'm not sure why he formulates it this way. I don't know if it's just to make it an interesting story. I mean, it's very compelling to think about, oh, yeah, we killed him and now he's dead and now it's just left up to us. That's kind of, you know, it makes a nice parable. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think it also can be a parable of the development of mankind. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's how he intends it. He never spells it out this way. But in the development of man, it was an important step that we would see something happen and assume that it happened because somebody did something. You know, that that was the development of our sense of agency. Mm -hmm. And if you see something happening and you assume it has no cause, you're not going to get very far in life. Mm -hmm. So understanding causes have effects. Was Part of our survival. Important. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the development of the human brain. Yeah. And God was tied up in that because anything that didn't have a readily explainable effect the effect could therefore be God, and you could maintain the knowledge and understanding of cause leading to an effect. And at some point, the development of mankind has been able to start chipping away at all of the things that we used to put in the God camp. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what Zizek meant when he said you can get to atheism through Christianity, but saying, you know, in almost a Nietzsche-like way, God is dead, mm -hmm. not literally because we've killed him, but because we've kind of grown up. Mm -hmm. It's in the same way that the tooth fairy is dead once you realize, oh, that was actually just my parents. Mm -hmm. Do you think, then, that Christianity critiques itself with Adam and Eve, that once you eat from the tree of the, or the fruit from the tree of knowledge and you gain that knowledge, you're expelled from the realm of the divine because you no longer belong there once you know how things work? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't think it's intended think that, that way, but I think yeah. based upon what you said, you could read it as yeah. a critique of itself. And also innocence, like the divine is is a, like a safe innocence where you're able to understand the world because the world is simplified for you. And then once you know more about the world, it's more complicated and you just can't go back there. So yeah, it has a lot of different par parallels. Yeah, I think Adam and Eve just basically gets to al almost a truism that with knowledge comes responsibility and also a loss of innocence you know the innocence is kind of you know one way to define it would be a lack of responsibility you can't be expected to be responsible for this thing because you don't understand it you're not mature enough mm -hmm. and with knowledge comes that so i think part of it of adam and eve i think is probably just like the idea of people growing up and having to become responsible on an individual level but I think it also applies at the societal level at, at a certain point, that the exact same lesson, whether it was intended this way or not, applies to the, the loss of religious ideas and the replacement of them with ideas of science. You mentioned the big other before as a, as a theme that Zizek reaches back to. Um, and so can you explain that a little bit more for me? Because I have a note on that and it connects to the, the Christian idea. But what what, do, what did Lacan mean about the Big Other? And well, the, if there is no God, then everything is permitted thing. It's it's the, that idea that there is this other thing that you do. You do this. You, you go through these actions because there's always this other mm -mm, okay. there. And, you know, 
you're always looking at yourself as if you're also always being looked at sort mm. of thing. Almost like Althusser's, you're always already a subject, I, I think. I think another part of The Big Other is that The Big Other, from the Marxist point of view, is something that doesn't really exist. It's yeah. always a fantasy, it's an ideology that actually is just a way to maintain the society. A couple other examples that Zizek gives is like the party, or sometimes represented by Stalin in in Soviet Russia, mm -hmm. that you could see as everything was subjugation of ourselves to the preservation of the party. And I don't know if he does it in the movie, but he also will point this out in some of his lectures that in ancient Greece, the gods were kind of the big other, mm. and they'd have statues on top of buildings that no human could actually see. Like, the, from any place the human could be, you'd never see the statue. So who was it for? It was for the big other. So the big other is, is a presence, whether abstract or placed onto a particular party or person, that is a reason for acting the way you do, the reason to be civil or moral, and like he, and well... To, to adhere to the value system that you have in place. Yeah, it's it's almost like a a metaphorical father figure. Okay. Yeah, and I and this sort of the point point was already made with religion versus atheism, but I thought this was another interesting way that he put it is in that Christianity actually disintegrates the big other and gives more freedom to the religious than and is more atheist than the usual atheism. Because he says, he argues that atheists still have, they still assume a big other. They still assume a reason to be moral, whether it's evolution, whether it's, it's chaos theory, like whether it's society. Like the, the culture you live in is the reason to maintain the values of that culture. Like we still assume some other thing, but the Christianity allows you sort of to dissolve that. Because what we've talked about, when you feel like you have been cl cleansed of the things you've done wrong, when you feel like you have that back door out of that judgment, that big other isn't looking at you. He isn't scrutinizing you so hard. There's a way out of his gaze. But if you don't look at it as you get a you, you get a backdoor way out of doing things wrong, like you you still have that all the time. And that was interesting. That that was that was a cool uh, disconnect to think about. That he actually led me down the, a road where I agreed that religion is in some ways more atheistic than atheism. Well, Mother Teresa was basically basically an atheist. Oh, yeah, it, it came out in a lot of her letters after her death, how much she was struggling with her faith. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, didn't stop her from doing what she was doing, because obviously to Which her was... that mattered more whether whatever faith she had at the time, like what the things she was doing to help people. So I don't know, do we kind of want to move to the end? Because there was like a little bit where he, he kind of wraps it up towards the end. I, th I think he's, he's sort of giving us a message moving forward from the movie. Um, and it's when he talks about dreams. Um, he gets there because he talks about bad dreams. I won't even go into that. But he talks about like the first step to freedom uh, is not to change the reality to fit your dreams, but to change your dreams. And he talks about how this is painful um, to a lot of people because their dreams... It is very difficult to change your dreams because what it has to address is that your dreams are maybe not yours. They're maybe influenced by other factors that you're not uh, privy to and it's really hard to sort of to peel apart that that uh that sticker you know like it le might leave a little residue behind it might leave uh like when you pull a sticker off a piece of paper you might rip some of the paper with it it can be painful and and but what you really need to do is actually address that sometimes your dreams aren't your own and change those uh and that was yeah that was a cool message to end on i also think for the ending if anybody watches this movie and everyone should i highly recommend it to watch through the credits for his little Jack Dawson thing for Titanic. Oh, or yeah. I believe he says something like, No, Rose, they'll never let go because you can't get rid of ideas. They'll always live on. And then he sinks under the water and just, <laughs> his fist comes up. Yep. They're like vampires. Yeah. Which I guess you could say is just a metaphor for capitalism, too, because, I mean, that's, that's what capitalism 
also does. It, it sucks the vitality out of the worker, making them work to enrich themselves like a vampire. 